Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm the co-maintainer of the Linux kernel. So, graphic subsystem beforehand, I, I was maintainer for quite a while for the Intel driver. Um, I'm working for Intel's open source graphics center. And I'm gonna talk about everything great about upstream graphics. And for context first, uh, obviously this title is only relevant because uh, 10 years ago or so, things were most definitely not everything great. So 10 years ago, we, we just about, oh, a bit more than 10 years ago, we merged the, the graphics execution manager, which is like the first attempt Linux has ever seen as something resembling a remotely modern uh, memory manager for graphics, which is mer merged kernel mode setting Oh, which is a bit of a label swindle because there was already kernel mode setting in the form of FBDEF. Well, this was kind of kernel mode setting for, for kind of big desktop GPUs with OpenGL integrated. So we, ha we, we just started this entire FBDEF versus DRM struggle uh, and total confusion about so which mode setting driver do you actually want. Uh, they were probably celebrating OpenGL for, uh, two, like five years behind the industry. So, so it was pretty depressing. Um, the, if we scroll forward to the day, uh, the kernel, uh, the, the graphics subsystem in the kernel is like 10% of the kernel plus user space. So it's one of the biggest subsystem there, there is in the kernel. So from nothing to, to kind of the biggest thing, or one of the biggest. Uh, we have uh, 50 full atomic mode setting drivers, which is kind of the latest and greatest in display that we support, or display user space APIs that we support, which is kind of fun because I've done a similar talk uh, two months ago at Plumbers, and back then the number was 50. So we do merge these drivers at a pretty brisk pace. Uh, on the user space side, we support all the latest and greatest stuff nowadays with OpenGL, GLES, Vulkan. And I think that the most impressive part, really, is uh, we've, we've taken these desktop mode setting and, and memory management ideas and cut them down until they were so tiny that they were tiny enough for the tiniest embedded stuff. So now we have uh, the smallest full uh, display atomic driver that we have is less than 250 lines, including white space and curly braces and the, uh, the, the, the licensing comment. And the biggest one we have is like 2.2 million lines of code. Probably bigger by now, I didn't recheck that number. So we have like a factor of 10,000 between the smallest and the biggest driver. Uh, so yeah, that, that smallest driver is, I mean, it's not a joke. It has hot on plug support. It supports the full atomic uh, user space API uh, with compatibility layers on top for the old uh, legacy atomic that we've merged 10 years ago, and it supports FBDEF with all bells and whistles. It uses uh, DEFM memory management so that everything just gets cleaned up and the, the things get shut down. It has DMA buff import export support, so you can actually like render on a GPU and then display. On, on this, it's, it's for a tiny little panel behind an SPI uh, bus. Uh, like display it there and the kernel will do all the synchronization so you don't start displaying before the thing is, or copying the buffer to the panel before the thing is actually rendered and user space just queues it all up and can forget about it. It doesn't have suspend resume, which would be a grand total of two more functions and probably like five to 10 lines of code. I guess the people who, who didn't, uh, wrote this, I uh, just didn't need this. So, oh, I do think like the upstream graphics subsystem has, has fully arrived in the embedded world for like tiny displays in tiny drivers. Uh, so let, let, let's look at uh, all, all the things it took to get there. And I think one, one of the most important things is this new atomic mode setting API, which instead of, of like an entire forest of IOCTLs to set up your display, you have like this one atomic IOCTL and you say, here's all the changes you want, I want to do for the next frame, here's all the composition changes, all the 
like color management changes with all the right buffers, do it. And uh, so the, the, this, the cool thing with this atomic method API is also the motivation for it really spanned from embedded. The, we have lots and lots of scanner planes for low power, uh, low power use, use cases like displaying a video embedded in a, fr in, in, in a browser window where you want to use a special plane for this video and freeze everything else up to the big desktops where you have lots and lots of outputs. And then the problem more is like how can I configure like the three, four screens and outputs that I have without getting past the hardware limits. Uh, we, we added like blending, we added right back so you can freeze down your com composition and kind of use your display as a, as a composition engine which is a lot more power efficient than rendering stuff with, with GLELs. Uh, color conversion, uh, gracefully handling uh, link failures nowadays. Like if you plug in a display port cable, there's, there's an entire computer on that thing. And it fails. And we can now tell the user space that, oops, sorry, something broke, please try again. Or you need to like reduce the resolution, change your desktop. Or we even have like content protection, so Netflix works on Chrome OS. Uh, and pretty much everything else. So this is the user space API, which has made a tremendous improvement and kind of helped us unify between the FBDF embedded world and the big desktop world where the kind of the, the graphics people, or at least where I started personally, uh, and, and managed to unify this all. But all, if you have such a massive user space API, uh, you, you don't write this in 250 lines of code. So what we also have is lots and lots of kernel internal helpers that help you break down this complexity and uh, allow you yeah, to, to write a driver that implements this full-featured API in, in very few lines of code. So there's uh, the entire mode setting helpers for this atomic framework which is designed to be very modular. So for example, if you're a big desktop GPU, uh, maybe the, the suggested implementation flow or, or commit flow, how you program the whole bit doesn't fit for all your different outputs. So you rewrite that uh, for your driver, but maybe your desktop GPU is very simple plain hardware, so we just reuse that and you're good. And on, on the flip side, maybe you have uh, a special sequence before you enable the plane, so you can uh, add that. So it's, 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 it's very flexible, and most drivers kind of use something between maybe a few functions from that library to just use it completely. Then on top of that, and, and this is what allows this cool party trick with, with the tiny driver, is, is kind of the simple display pipe uh, helper which takes, I mean, because if, if, if all you have is a panel where you just upload the next frame, you, you don't need all these features. You don't have write back. You don't have uh, entire color management and, and, and adjustment pipeline there. It's just you copy the buffer and you're done. And then there's one GPIO to enable the panel and shut it down or maybe reset it if it's very fancy. So we have the simple display pipe helper, which takes all the super flexible atomic user space API and breaks it down to you have one thing and here's your update function. Um, this has allowed us to, when you take an old FBDEF driver from the FBDEF system and convert it over to, to atomic with all the helpers for output for EID parsing uh, on this simple display pipe, uh, those drivers actually shrink by usually a factor of two to four. So, so nowadays, kind of the, the subsystem that started with big desktops is better at embedded than the subsystem that started at embedded. Um, uh, the self-refresh uh, helpers, I'm going to talk later on about that. And uh, you get full-featured FBDF emulation with like one line. So including vBlank support so that your proprietary Molly 
non-open source user space driver can just directly render into your frame buffer. This, it all works. Uh, lessons learned from Atomic. So Atomic is, is kind of like a database. It's, it's, you commit and either everything goes through or nothing goes through. On the, the traditional way to do that is you, you start committing and then you roll back and someone is gonna forget that one register right or something. On, and making sure it all works. Uh, looked like very fragile design. We tried to do that in some prototyping. Instead, what we're doing in Atomic is the entire state update is a complete new copy of the entire driver state. So for every uh, scan out engine, for every hardware plane, for every output, we have state structures. And they're completely freestanding. So rollback is just you free a bit of memory and you're done which makes it, it, it very safe. And it also makes it, makes it a lot easier to catch a driver box in review because in Atomic we also allow user space to just ask, would this work? Which is needed because generally you first need to think about your composition, like what are you gonna use the display hardware for? What are you gonna uh, composite with the GL engine? Obviously, as much as possible with the display because that's more power efficient. And then once you made that decision, then you start rendering with the GL engine, and then you do the actual commit to hardware. And if the third step fails, you're screwed because you've already done all the rendering, assuming it will work out. So we have, we have this atomic check, check only uh, mode, which just tells you, would this work, yes or no? And obviously this is not allowed to change any driver state or any hardware state. And by having these completely freestanding state structures, uh, we make it a lot easier to, to catch kind of bugs in this area. Um, I, I said already, uh, like making the helpers as, as modular as possible so you can pick and choose ha has been really good. Another thing we do, um, so the model in Atomic is you have objects which kind of represent things in your hardware, and then properties, which is things you can change, and then values, so it's, it's triples. But semantically, they're, they're all strings, or a lot of them are strings like enumeration thingies. But for encoding, we just have uh, uh, triples of unsigned integers. And the encoding and decoding is all done in the core which I think helps a lot in kind of forcing standardization. So the driver never sees kind of these, these funny values. It, it only ever sees C structures where you can use real enum types in C or where you, instead of having an object ID, you grab a reference for that object and you fill in the pointer. And so all that bookkeeping is not in the driver code. Um, we, we were also solving the locking entirely in the core. So if the driver, for example, has uh, two outputs and you can share planes between them, and for example, you have four here and four on the other, and now user space wants to use eight on the other, it needs to grab the state from the second pipeline so it can reallocate these, um, these planes. And obviously this needs a bit of locking because user spies in the second thread might also want to do something over here. And, and for correctness, the way the locking works is the driver just asks for the state objects in its atomic check function. And it tries to compute whether this is possible or not. And internally, every time we grab a new state, uh, the, the atomic core takes care of all the locking and the deadlock avoidance is just kind of um, complicated thing because we essentially do graph locking as the only subsystem in the kernel. Uh, so this state getting might fail because we can't get the lock and you need to kind of retry. Maybe not so great as uh, we definitely need new tests. So starting the beginning this year, this is now mandatory. We have a user space test suite on the we should have proper user space API spec decks for all these, these properties, which uh, we need to do sooner than later. But it's, it's not yet mandatory. Well, it's not yet quite clear what's, what's the best way to do this. Uh, 
case study for a helper is, is like self-refresh and, and manual upload, so you have a panel, and it has its own frame buffer, and it does nothing. And every time you want to change something, or you need to kind of manually upload the changed area of your frame buffer to, to the panel, uh, and a somewhat similar concept is self-refresh, where if you continuously send frames, you, you switch the mode to not sending frames. And uh, obviously the trouble is, anytime something changes, you need to make sure that the update gets to the panel in both of these cases, and you're not just showing the same frozen screen because you stopped updating. And there's lots of, of entry points. There's the FBDF emulation that you might need. There's the old KMS kernel mode setting. There's the new atomic interface. Uh, and what we're doing is with, with the damage tracking helpers, we, we kind of provide the driver a unified entry point. So from the driver point of view, like you wire up the damage tracking thing and all these user space APIs look the same. Obviously you can overwrite them if there's some legacy compatibility thingies. Uh, and user space can even tell you like, I just changed this tiny part of the screen, please only upload that if you can. And the same with self-refresh. I mean, self-refresh is essentially you shut down the entire display, except you don't shut down the panel because the user is still looking at that. So we have a, a, a helper which um, uh, keeps track of that, like switches everything back on again as soon as, as activity kicks in. And essentially, the, the only thing besides like plugging that helper uh, implementation in into your driver is in your, your panel's enable and disable function, you need to check that if you're going in self-refresh mode or not, and not shut down the panel if it's just self-refresh. So essentially, uh, all this complexity is, is all in, in the helper code, and the actual driver implementations is, is like one, two handful lines of code. Oh, we, ha we have more awesome stuff here. Uh, just again, all motivated by SSCs and embedded uh, systems, making the drivers more modular. We have bridges, which are kind of transcoder thingies, because everyone uses the same HDMI transcode, more or less. Uh, we have panel drivers, because they're, they all have kind of different quirks. So you can have a, a generic driver, and you just plug in your panel driver, pardon, uh, with, with, uh, with DT. Uh, and we have quite a bit of, of support for more general components so you can stitch together your, your driver with uh, kind of the, the standard Linux ARM soft uh, DT approach with, with the device tree bindings. There's, there's also a lot of ongoing work in this, this area with, with trying to manage the state for these bridge chips better, integrate it better with Atomic, maybe expose it, or uh, like allowing you to chain these uh, uh, bridges, kind of just generally more uh, flexibility. We've had quite a bit of work in making hot unplug work, which is mostly really useful for development, so you unplug your, your panel and plug in the next one into your SPI bus, like dude, if the kernel doesn't freeze. And at least for, for display only drivers, this works now. Uh, on the render side, we still have a lot of, of, of like, a lot more kind of data structures that are shared with other drivers, like for zero copy and all that. Uh, the, it, the reference scanning isn't quite correct uh, yet. And uh, related to that, uh, everyone loves to use the device managed allocation and, and everything else APIs. The problem is uh, that the user space visible data structures have different lifetime rules than your physical device, and most drivers get this wrong. So the, we're slow in the process of, of providing equally simple support, but with the correct lifetime rules. So that, that's all the display stuff. Uh, there's, there's obviously also rendering, like GL and, and things, and in the kernel, uh, we, ha we have an entire bouquet of, of APIs created over the last 10 years to make not just zero copy work, 
which is what DMA valve for it, uh, is for, but make zero copy and synchronization in user, user, uh, user space just submits an entire queue. So you could do stuff like decode a new frame on, on your uh, MPEG decoder in Video for Linux. That's at least the idea. I think it's not quite merged there yet. Or pass that to like your OpenGL render block, do something with it, and then pass it to the display on the kernel using these DMA reservation and DMA fences behind uh, the C oh, behind user space, make sure that all all these uh, all these operations are ordered correctly so that they don't start before the previous one has completed. Um, which in extreme cases creates a graph locking problem where someone starts here and starts locking buffers and, and driver states and someone starts over here and then they meet in the middle and doesn't work. So we have this weight van mutex stuff in the kernel, in the core kernel actually, which uh, allows you to, to solve generic uh, graph locking problems. So you can just have arbitrary set of buffers or whatever you want and just lock them in any arbitrary way and it does reliably detect deadlocks and get you out of the bind. Um, this is motivated by Vulkan, uh, uh, the, the DRM sync objects, which is, is kind of these DMA fences for ordering uh, concurrent uh, things in, in, in a kind of more modern way that, that fits into the spirit of, of Vulkan. Uh, if you do all that sharing, drivers also need to agree on what the data actually looks like. Uh, there's no reasonable or useful standard in that. So in the, in the, in the graphics subsystem, we created our own 4CC standard, which is officially used by OpenGL, EGL, and, and Vulkan. And we have modifiers for stuff like tiling formats or uh, frame buffer compression, so the ARM frame buffer compression uh, is, now, is now supported by quite a lot of drivers. So you can not just do zero copy, but you can do zero copy of compressed data. And so save, save even more memory uh, bandwidth. And so this, this is kind of all the, the, the almost all the, the user space relevant pieces. Uh, we also have a lot of helpers uh, for implementing these drivers, uh, a scheduler, a TTM is kind of the memory manager, or one of the memory manager, which is a bit monolithic, and is seeing a lot of uh, refactoring. We have uh, VRAM helpers, so for kind of the old chips that still seem to survive, which have a little bit of onboard uh, video memory. Uh, although I think most of that is moving just to the panels, but not always, so you can manage that. And then the SMAM, so the shared memory helpers, which is for all the, all the SOCs that just use normal memory. And as, as usual, like on the display side, battery is included. Now obviously, um, a graphics stack is, is not just the kernel. Uh, there's also lots of lots of uh, stuff going on in, in user space. Uh, so the, the big things there is, is the Gallium layer that we have. A, for writing GL drivers, so GL, especially on the desktop GL side, a bit less on the GLES side, is a very old, very quirky API. And this, this Gallium thing essentially takes that and breaks it down to something that looks a lot more uh, modern, a lot more kind of almost like Vulkan, where you just have constant state objects and nothing changes anymore, and the driver can just uh, write these, these commands to hardware and it becomes a lot more simple. Uh, we have a huge uh, uh, compiler framework called NU, which uh, very creatively it stands for new IR, so new intermediate representation. What's going on? Uh, Anyway, and, and this, this is used by all the, all the GL drivers. Uh, we have reverse engineering tools, which at least for some companies seem to be better and more powerful at documenting hardware than what the real hardware companies have. And Kronos, the, the, 
industry standards groups that's defining GL and Vulkan and, and GLES and all these standards, they're also opening up, so they have an open source test suite for conformance testing. Uh, you, you can do bug reports. So in the, in the user space side, I would also say uh, lots of great infrastructure and, and uh, uh, good movements to its open driver. So specifically for SOC, since this year across the kernel and uh, the, the Mesa 3D user space stack, we have mostly reverse engineer, but drivers for pretty much anything you can buy in SOC, from the tiniest, uh, Vivante cores, which still don't have an IOMMU or anything else really, up to, to kind of the, the big SOCs that IMD and Intel are shipping. Uh, all these drivers use the Gallium framework, so even Intel has, has now switched over to that. And I think one of the most interesting stories that's happening right now uh, is there's a, a Vulkan driver for AMD hardware, the, the Rad B driver, which is not developed by AMD, because the AMD one is kind of closed so throw stuff over the wall open source, whereas this one is developed by customers and community and, and OSVs. Uh, plus the ACO, again, very creative name, is just the AMD compiler, which is a new compiler based on this NER thing. It's, really, it's a very small team, like about a handful of people. Uh, of customers who use this, like Wolf is using this uh, on their Steam machines, Steam boxes with Linux, and uh, they're beating AMD. So just to show that, that how, how good these helpers and all this code is in user space, uh, it's, it's competitive against an entire company. So uh, maybe short interlude because it's, it's a frequently asked questions. Why, why do they Kernel people insist on open source user space. Uh, one is it's, it's just a technical necessi necessity. And other subsystems like AI, uh, RDMA and I think media is also moving that way that create a lot of user space API agree. You, you can't review the kernel side if you don't see the user space. And the other thing is also it's a bit of cake and eat it too, have your cake and eat it too situation. I mean from the upstream of customer value standardization and uh, if you want to do lots of uh, vendor value add in, in your closed source user space, it's, it's kind of you want to have it both ways, what just doesn't work. Uh, so the, the recommendation, and that's, that's officially okay with everyone, is if you want to do special source vendor lock-in uh, in, in, in one driver, you know, in your closed source driver, you can just do that but we still still require uh, an open source implementation for the user space API. And so for pretty much all these chips for SOCs, there's now a dual stack implementation. So if you ask the right people in those companies with the right questions, they can give you both a fully open source user space or uh, like the closed source kind of standard, sometimes more standard uh, driver running on top of upstream. Uh, which leads us to the next thing. So how do you st ship this? Because like in, in the abstract I promised, it's not just awesome upstream, you can actually ship this. And the recommendation I would say is definitely just do a dual stack with closed source and open source user space, uh, both running on the one single upstream kernel driver. Uh, and then there's still the problem for backporting because upstream is just not used often enough, like everyone's hanging around on LTS kernels that are at least two years old. And the recommendation there is don't backfold the driver that leads to manners because then you first spend refactoring the driver and making it really small and using it all the, all, all, making sure it uses all the helper functions. And then you, 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 you need an equally big backfold team that re-adds all the crap. It's just pointless. So backport the entire subsystem, that's pretty much what everyone does. And from what I'm understanding, the Android kind of stable kernel interface thing, uh, the GKI, I think it's called, will also switch that to that model. So every time Android adds new kernels, they'll backport 
the latest upstream DRM subsystem to all their supported kernels so that you don't have to like live with old stuff. Uh, also nice stuff going on on the testing side. Uh, we have lots of in-kernel unit tests, so we're very much looking forward to KUnit finally having landed so we can convert them over to something uh, uh, more standardized. Uh, we're using the IGT GPU test saw, uh, test suite, which is kind of a, a, a cross driver. Uh, test suite and user space to, to validate. And as I mentioned, for any new user space API, having, having validation test suites in there is now required to, to kind of help make sure that all the drivers implement these interfaces the same way. For validating, we use uh, CRCs from the hardware. So you can render in software, and then you can like put a YUV plane somewhere and render it using hardware planes, and we compare the two CRCs uh, to, to make sure everyone implements it the same way. And right now, uh, unfortunately not all hardware has, has CRC support. Some have Brightback, which is more powerful, so right now there's, there's patches on the review for IGT uh, to add uh, validation with Brightback. Uh, I think we also have a pretty great uh, community. Uh, they're, they're switching over to GitLab, so mailing lists are dead. At least for everything except the kernel. For the kernel, it is a bit uh, uh, stalled on infrastructure work. But the idea is very much that at least pull requests from subsystems will, will use GitLab long term with nicely integrated CI. And I, I do think we will at least run experiments with opening up uh, GitLab for pull requests, kind of nice modern integrated review, code change, and CI solutions uh, for, for contributors. Our conference, which uh, is called XTC, is, is also nicely growing and going full professional now. We have sponsors since, since last year. Uh, slide outlook, uh, DMA buff heaps, uh, which formerly uh, still called ION is in staging, is, is getting destaged. Um, I'm hearing it's happening real soon now. It's, I think, in version seven or so. So hopefully one of the next kernel releases this will, will have happened. Uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, in kind of user space allocators. I mean, it's, it's nice if you, in theory, can share compressed buffers with zero copy between drivers. But if no one can figure out that this is possible, uh, it's, it's a bit of a tough sell. And the current solution, I think, with Android is you just hard code it in Greylock. Uh, doesn't work so well on desktop and doesn't really great design for, for SOCs either. So there's this quite a bit going on there. And another thing that's not really in patch form yet, uh, but lots of discussion going on is uh, integration with kind of the media side, which um, is uh, solving a lot of the same problems around buffer permanence and sharing buffers and integrating it all into an overall pipeline. There sometimes they have a nice solution, or sometimes like the the display side, the DRM subsystem side has has a better solution, or kind of more experience. And it would be nice to somehow figure out how we can get these two subsystems to to work together a bit more closely. But the details are, I think, entirely up in the air how how that will look like. So a summary. Uh, DRM, the, the graphics subsystem in, in upstream, uh, it scales by a factor of 10,000 from the tiniest to the biggest. Uh, I really think like nowadays we have batteries included for everything. Uh, for shipping, I would say that the standard is a dual stack. You have your one single upstream kernel driver uh, for GL and GLES on you have a dual stack in user space with a reverse engineered, mostly, most often reverse engineered uh, driver to kind of justify the user space API and uh, the closed source stack with all the value add. And uh, for shipping, second point is you just backport the entire subsystem. That's what everyone does. And that's it. I think we have.
maybe no time for questions, but perhaps if there's a very short one. Otherwise, thanks a lot for listening.